see everybody that's here. So good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I want to thank you all for coming today to Emerging Spaces for Latinx in Wisconsin, the cradle of new leaders. Andrea Tess Arenas has joined us today to introduce us to the Wisconsin Latinx History Collective, an organization that was created in partnership with the Wisconsin Historical Society and the UW-Madison Chicanx and Latinx Studies Program. And they will spend the next five years documenting the history of Latinx people in the state of Wisconsin. Tessa Reynes will share stories of Latinx people with connections to rural and urban Wisconsin as examples of new leaders, as well as the need to develop meaningful community connections, which honor contributions and victories that have been made over the year. Through their leadership, we are gonna collect those oral histories so that all Wisconsinites know the various leadership stories that are taking place. By show of hands, how many people have heard the phrase, you can't really know where you're going until you know where you've been? Okay, love it. So those words of wisdom were from the phenomenal poet and author, Maya Angelou. And to me, that's what's important about this project and about sharing the stories. It's the opportunity for all of us, especially our students, to know more deeply their history. So when we share stories, we will see how much we are more alike than different. And our campus has a rich history of collecting oral histories, and this project showcases that expertise and it extends our community's voices. But before we begin the program, I'd like to acknowledge the land upon which we stand, work, and live. We at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay acknowledge the First Nations people who are original inhabitants of the region, the Ho-Chunk Nation, and the Menominee Nation are the original first people of Wisconsin. And both nations have ancient historical and spiritual connections to the land that our institution now resides upon. Today, Wisconsin is the home to 12 First Nations communities, including the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, Forest County, Potawatomi, Ojibwe Nation communities, Stockbridge, Muncie community, Band of Mohican Indians, and the Brothertown Indian Nation. We acknowledge the First Nations peoples of Wisconsin. Now for the introduction of our speaker. Andrea Tess Arenas, the name may sound familiar to some of you because in 2018, she actually spoke on our campus to promote her book, Somos Latinas. Andrea Teresa Tess Arenas, an award-winning Chicana poet, has been engaged in communities of color for over 40 years as an activist, policymaker, and college instructor. Arenas is from a low-income family the daughter of an undocumented parent and a first-generation college graduate. Arenas considers herself a late bloomer because she started college at age 30 and eventually earned her PhD from UW-Madison. Arenas is a founding member of the Latina Task Force, Justice for Daisy Mendez, and Wisconsin Hispanic Council on Higher Education, which worked to have the first Latinx Board of Regents member, Ness Flores, a former migrant worker 
in the 1980s. Arez served as the Assistant Vice President of Academic Diversity and Development at UW System for nearly 20 years and led the system in campuses in creating Plan 2008, the educational excellence through race, ethnic diversity. In 2005, Arenas joined UW-Madison as the Director of the College of Letters and Sciences, Office of Service Learning, and community-based research in Chicanx Latin Studies as a faculty assistant, I'm sorry, a faculty affiliate. Arenas embedded service learning or community-based learning research projects in all of her courses and connected students to over 60 projects across the state in multiple race, ethnic communities. While at UW-Madison, Arenas created the Somos Latinos Digital History Project of Wisconsin in fall 2012, and her students conducted 43 video recorded oral history interviews, which are now online with the Wisconsin Historical Society. Upon retirement, Tass also co-authored Somos Latinos, Voices of Wisconsin Latina Activists in 2018, which won two National Book Awards. In January 2020, Arenas founded the Wisconsin Latinx Historical Collective, which will document Latinx people, businesses, and events through 2030 in partnership with the Wisconsin Historical Society, Chicanx and Latinx Studies at UW-Madison, and Chicana Por Mi Praza Digital Memory Collective and university partners across the state. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Tass Arenas. It's so good to be back in Green Bay. Um, I want to start out by thanking, first of all, Vice Chancellor Dawn Krim for, and her team for the incredible marketing work that they've done for this event. I told them they need to offer a course on marketing. They did such a wonderful job generating audiences for the various parts of the next two days. And I also want to acknowledge Chancellor Mike Alexander for his leadership in helping you as aspire as an emerging HSI institution, Hispanic serving institution. So you, you're blessed with a wonderful team here, and I'm very grateful for all of you coming today to hear about the work we're doing and the possible role that your campus can play. So today I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to talk about the new demographics of Wisconsin and what it can mean for us as institutions of higher ed. We're going to talk about some of the emerging leaders from Wisconsin who may or may not be familiar, but some of them are from Green Bay. I will also highlight the development of our community connections through oral histories and how that might help you in your nine county recruitment region. You know, with four campuses, as an emerging HSI, I really feel you have an edge. But don't say that to the others that are seeking this. But I, I feel you do. And finally, we will talk about a little bit about how we use oral histories and the archive collections to circle back into the PK-12 population. As we emerge as this growing demographic in the P-12 arena, what we do must be fed back into those classrooms so our students know the possibilities that are there for them. So, with that in mind, let me tell you a little bit about myself, although Dawn you know, gave you an overview. I come from a low-income family. My father was undocumented from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, which I did not learn until I was 55 years old. He lied the entire time um, as a protection. 
I attended a white high school that was college prep, Pulaski in Milwaukee. Whereas my brothers and sister, went, the lines for the schools changed and their neighborhood school became South Division, a predominantly Latino high school with a focus on tourism. The quality of education between the two high schools, the difference was profound. Uh, of my brothers that did attend South, three of them dropped out. So it became very clear to me at the age of 14 that there were educational inequities, and that really spurred my life throughout my life. When I went to high school, Again, as a low-income student, I had free lunch coupons that were different colors than the rest of the kids. My books, I could not afford, so all three sides of them were stamped indigenous, in, indigent student. So everyone in the white high school, I'm one of four Chicanas, and everyone in the white high school knew I was on welfare. So it wasn't always a fun time. As kids, we were a family of eight, my father, my stepfather was a maintenance man, a janitor. We couldn't join any clubs because it required dues. We couldn't join any clubs if they required uniforms. We couldn't go on any trips because it cost money. We couldn't get a driver's license because my parents' car insurance would go up just by having licensed drivers in the home. So life was pretty contracted. Growing up at this time, my role models were really African-American and indigenous activists, those who made the mainstream press. And so I read the column of Alvin Poussant, a very famous at the time African psychologist who dealt with black identity, and Manning Marable, also another black radical scholar. Not until high school did I learn of the work of Cesar Chavez. That's when he made the mainstream news. Upon graduation from high school, I wanted to attend college, but I was only 17. I actually stayed in school in an extra semester because I was too young to work yet. Uh, so I asked my parents to fill out the FAFSA and college app, and my mother said no. And she said, you're a woman, and the only thing you're supposed to do is find a husband, get married, and make babies. That's your job. So at 17, I had no options. They, my parents found me my first job and told me what I was going, where I was going to work because I was still underage. When I finally did go to college at 29 at over a week in college, I worked full time. And that's when I learned about my math anxiety, how bad it was. I was in the stats class, pulling my hair out, sick to my stomach. And I begged my professor for a role model, a woman of color who, who did very well in stats. And he found me one. She was African American. And I said, that's wonderful, but where are we? So again, I was left with no visible role model. Once I got involved with the Wisconsin Hispanic Council on Higher Education, I was surrounded by role models, Latinos in higher education faculty and academic staff, and it was like my world exploded. So this is me. I'm on the swing. And that's my sullen brother next to me. I went to Pulaski, that's the smile. He went to South Division, that's the look. <laughs> so let's move on and talk a little bit about the demography of Wisconsin. As you know, we're now the fastest growing population in the state. And for example, in Milwaukee, it would have shrunk if it had not been for the Latino population. And as you're aware of, there are now pockets of Latinx in the state that never saw a brown face other than in the dairy industry or migrant workers. 
but that's changed dramatically, which is why the work we are doing, we feel, is so important. Here you have the Latino population in various shades of blue, where the darkest is the most populous in 20, 2000. 210, watch the dark blue. 214. So we're growing in remarkable spaces across Wisconsin. So why do we do this? Without a recorded history, we have no role models, and we cannot value a population and a people because it's silent. So there are archival silences for Latinx in Wisconsin, and there are history voids for documenting Latinx in Wisconsin. And that's our work, is to remove those silences and fill them with stories from an individual's perspective. I like to describe oral history as your life, your memories, your experience, your truth in your words, not mine or the words of a researcher. That's the beauty of oral history from my perspective, is we hear from their voice. Working on SOMOS and the collective, I came up with the motto of our history is no value unless our children know it. Again, without role models. So we're using what I call a circular approach. Get the history documented, create lesson plans, feed it back to P12 so that everyone is rising and our communities benefit from this work. Rather than being used as study objects, we are now the main actors for new curriculum so that P12 is successful in your nine county recruiting area. We're also looking at this work as a way to develop undergraduates for graduate school. I had a great fear of math, and I thought I couldn't do a PhD without province statistics. I still had to take it. But I went qualitative, and that's when I found my niche. So what I, do in all, what I did in all my classes was differentiate between qualitative and quantitative, and if you had math anxiety, guess what? You're going to learn how to do field research, because it was always with the idea of promoting graduate education. So let's go to the history of what we did. We started out with the um, oral history project of Somos Latinas or the, for the eight years that I offered courses. This was embedded in the course. So they weren't oral history courses. They were Chicanx, Latinx courses. And one of the assignments was conduct one to three oral history interviews. And those were built into my courses. They were honor courses. They were senior uh, thesis courses and freshman seminars. So everyone across the ranks within the CLS program were able to participate. After the um, book, was the Voces del Campo Oral History Project at UW-Eau Claire. And then in 2020, we formed the collective. In 21 to 24, we're under the auspices of the Baldwin Grant, Wisconsin Idea Grant, which has funded 150 interviews, and we made gold this year. In 2022 to 2033, we will be receiving, if all goes well, a National History Public Records grant of a million dollars in which we produce digital additions for our website at the Wisconsin Historical Society. And I'll go a little more into what 
what that means. But the big news is we got the money. The other news is I have to generate about the same amount in order to get it all launched, but we'll do it. All right, the core team is really the um, policy and practitioner cohort of faculty. And as you can see, we have various campuses engaged in the work, uh, but Green Bay is not one of them yet. And I, I hope that uh, changes in the very near future. And all of these folks are from different disciplines and offer different types of courses in which they embed oral history. So the first block in this uh, diagram is the collective. As you can see, we have now grown beyond our wildest dreams. And under the collective, we subsumed Voces del Campo, Somos, and the three funding lines, the, lar the three large boxes, are our funding sources that we've obtained in the past three years. And the last is the implementation grant at the bottom, which funds us through 2033. So we started out with a five-year plan, and now we're at a 12-year plan. We grew much faster than expected. The anticipation for the work is very high. So areas of study for our oral histories. We'll take oral histories from any Latinx. We, but when we make our digital editions, which I'll explain later, we have areas of study that we'll highlight. So there will be a narrative with oral history and archives embedded on migration and immigration. The same for STEM. Those are the interviews I conduct. I love talking to scientists. And community formation, education, labor, as you can see. So with those broad categories, we're going to cluster the, the oral histories that have been generated. So the collective is really student-powered history. Without students, the SOMOS project could never have existed, which is why in the book we list every student that ever was involved in SOMOS. It is their work. The oral histories, when they go online, will go under the name of the student. We do not appropriate the work of anyone. We want everyone involved to get their just due. It's kind of a sticky point for communities of color of this appropriation issue, so we want to make sure we cover that. So without the students, this work could not happen. And the students come back with wonderful perspectives. They love learning from the elders and finding they have common ground. And it reinforces or reminds them of cultural values and the historical contributions of our people. What's the role of an instructor, faculty, or staff? You can offer a community-based research course, an independent study, supervise senior, senior theses, which include oral history. You can supervise a student organization, and the students are trained in oral history. You can become, as a staff or faculty member, you can do your own oral histories if you don't want to offer it through a course or supervising a student group. There are many ways to contribute to our history. So what the roles of the students are, they research their interviewee, they formulate questions, they conduct the interview and transcribe, they get a sound waiver, and then submit. Let's hear from Gabby. Now, I assume I just hit this, and it's going to play. One of the, the programs that we create is, uh, like I said, Freedom, Libertad. Mm -hmm. And this is a program that it seems like a, a, a beauty passion, but it's not beauty passion. We can have a, um, a lady who you don't care about the way that she looks. But if she's smart and if she want to keep going, she respect uh, her parents and it, it has to be a Latina. And um, 
why we support in this program just girls is because as a woman in our countries sometimes it's like uh, you don't have to keep going with school you're gonna get married and have kids and stop life stop down there and this is not true we are more than that and we need uh, parents to know that so that's why we try to create this program and say this is not a beauty passion but it's she deserves a coron if she's uh, a lady who's gonna go for wanted to go to college and this is the way that we give them scholarships like uh, um, the girl has to be involved in the community our uh, last queen uh, our queen for 2013 her name is Marisa Lessa and she belongs to one of the organizations she's running um, Voces de la Frontera and we support her a lot so we are proud of her we had a previous um, Eva Cruz also she worked with the Boys and Girls Club and Angelica Sanchez she's also in uh, one of the I think Milwaukee College all of those girls are being uh, girls who continue with education and we are so proud of her because somehow the whole community with the money that we were raising and working hard and volunteering we were able to give her or give them a little bit of our help as a Latinos in uh, in a school a school so Gabriela Gamboa lives here in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and is manager of the only Spanish radio station in the area. And she is in the Somos collection. What I like about Gabby's work is that, although I am not a fan of beauty pageants, when I first learned of what her group was doing, I said, tell me more. And then she explained, she took this cultural activity and flipped the, flipped the narrative and turned it from beauty to education and community involvement. So she, I really thought that was an innovative way to lead. And let's hear from another woman. One of the things that we figured out is that people want to get education. Um, also, as a learning experience for all of us, we learned that people want to, want to learn Spanish. And we all question why you're an American and you want to learn Spanish. And the reason is because you cannot learn another language when you don't know your own language. Mm -hmm. So that to me was a very open window in myself to learn that you need to ask people what they really want and instead of putting programs that are not really for, for helping our community. So we learned that if we give classes and, and we get the um, skills better in Spanish, they'd be able to learn English. Men is a sexual abuse and domestic violence therapist here in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And she is deeply involved with Casa Melanie, formerly Casa Alba, with sister at the time, uh, Melanie Matzik. She's now retired. And Elvita learned that even as a Latina, she walked in with certain assumptions about what our community needed. And based on those assumptions, she was quickly corrected and said, no, we don't want to learn English. We want to learn how to read and write Spanish first because we don't know how. And then we'll learn English. So her, her experience told her, listen first. So here we have two of the students from my undergraduate class at the home of Lupita Bejar, who is a folk singer, and would take corridos, which are traditional ballads honoring someone in particular. So there's a corrido, say, for Cesar Chavez. Uh, and Lupita would take the lyrics of the corrido and change them to political lyrics. And she led the Chicano Latino marches in the 70s and 80s by singing these corridos with new lyrics. And bless her bones, she donated all her original music with the lyrics written on the site. That is an archivist gold mine. So, and it, I have to tell you, most women cooked for us when we came to the home. We couldn't get out without eating, and Lupita had a spread. Here we have two students, Hector Salazar, 
Ohu and Nicole Cancel and Linda Garcia Merchant from Chicana Pobreza. These two students and I and Linda presented at the National Oral History Conference. Uh, Hector applied for the PhD program in nursing and medicine and his research course was waived based on his experience with oral history in Somos Latinas. Nicole Cancel changed her major from pre-med to social work, much to the dismay of her parents, and is now Sister Nicole in the only African-American boys' school left in the third ward of New Orleans. Voces del Campo started at UW Eau Claire under the auspice of Cheryl Jimenez Fry and Elena Casey. It involves faculty from public history, Spanish, nurse, and nursing, as well as Latinx studies. And they've done extensive oral history work in the dairy industry. And Latinos, Latinx represent about 70% of all dairy workers in the state, which is a multi-billion dollar industry. So we really have economic impact in that industry, amongst others. They also did Latinx life and culture in Western Wisconsin and worked with the Chippewa Valley M Museum and Latinx businesses to record history. So what do the students get from this? Carolina Ortega, UW-Madison, said that as a history student, it wasn't until my senior year that I had the opportunity to actually practice qualitative research methods through Somos Latina Digital History Project. I had another student, Alberto Cuevas, from Chicago, hardline Chicani, Chicano uh, left of center. Uh, I loved him. And he always critiqued. And we went up to Green Bay to interview Natalia Silon, who works for the Green Bay Police Department, only Latino in the police force. And on the way up, Alberto's going, and why are we interviewing a cop? They're the enemy. And I said, you know what, Alberto, let's wait and see what happens. Well, after the interview, he, I guess he had a change of heart. And Natalia has developed countless programs in her off hours in the Latino community. And at the end of the semester, Alberto got up with his team and they talked about what they walked away with. And Alberto said, much to his credit, I was wrong. I thought she was a pig and she's not. She's a goddess because of the work. And I, I thought that was really a wonderful indication of how people can, students can grow from this work. So again, Carolina said, Somos gave her the practice in her senior year. So we need to document Green Bay. The oral history possibilities in your nine recruiting counties is immense. We have businesses, churches, enclaves, soccer teams, card clubs, all of this exists in this nine county region. And Carolina is quoted once again on the possibility in, in the area. Now, you're an, um, seeking emerging HSI status in Wisconsin. There are seven other institutions that want that designation in Wisconsin. You're going to have stiff competition. And one of the benefits of working with the collective is you build your reputation in the community by honoring our stories. That will set you apart. But the recruitment will be intense. So differentiate yourself between the others by being involved. In a study done by one of my friends from grad school who just retired at Michigan, did the study of HSIs. And the area that HSIs listed as their weakest link was community connections. 
These are campuses with HSI status, and the faculty who answered the surveys and participated in the study said, we do a terrible job. Again, this is why you can differentiate yourself now by building that community connection with that love and mutual exchange to help you in your recruitment. And you can go beyond diversity and move to solidarity. For us, it's not so much about being recognized as included, as well as being supported in the issues that are important to us. So move from diversity to solidarity is another way to build community. There used to be studies in the Mexican community about the speed of chisme, gossip. The research show before the internet, we could get news spread faster in the barrio through chisme than phone calls. It just, everybody knows who's dating who and who's going underwater on their house and yada yada, right? Well, chisme has, the format of getting chisme has changed and it's now social media. And Latinx youth, are one of the highest users of social media. And the research shows that whatever reputation you build online, Latinos share. When they make major purchases, make major decisions, they use their social network for input, feedback, and advice. So now I, I think Chisme is at the speed of light and it's online. Another reason to build those healthy, embracing community connections with oral history. Now let's talk about archives, the other aspect of our work. At this point, I'm not asking Green Bay to get into archival work, although once you do interviews, you might find out that that person has an incredible collection they're willing to donate. Well, we were very lucky. Uh, my husband, John, Wiley, former chancellor of Madison, is now my dumpster dive partner. That's what I call doing archive work, dumpster dives. I'm in attics, I'm in moldy basements with my allergies and masks and crying because I can't breathe. And we come up with these jewels. Javier Sanchez was a charro, a rodeo, I guess you call it rodeo, a charro performer, which requires 46 skills on a horse including the Paseo de Muerte, the passage of death, where a rider goes between one horse and another as they gallop through the uh, corral. And, and so he was very good at that. So as a result, he had kept everything from the first MLS listing for the flat he bought on the south side of Milwaukee. He has his maleta, his suitcase, with a rope handle that he used when he crossed the border. He has letters from Wisconsin dairy owner begging him to come to Wisconsin and serve as the vet for the herd of dairy cows. He kind of did it all. And we were lucky enough to get most of it. So in the right left-hand corner, it's kind of hard to see from here, but I hope you can see it. It's his suede jacket. We got the full suede regalia, chaps, sword case, saddlebag, his lasso, his rope, his sombrero, as well as plans for a rodeo corral he built in uh, Oaxaca. Up in the right hand corner is a beige booklet. Can you see it over here? That's the prize. It's the official book of cockfighting, 1942 from Mexico, replete with two preserved cock claws. Yeah. We got those too. So that's, this is another aspect of the work. Once the oral history's done, we go back and find out what they want to donate. And some of this will also go online in those DEs. Here we have the triumphant trio, Melina Mueller, a Chicana 
from Milwaukee, myself, and Ricardo Gonzalez. Ricardo is Cubano. He was city alderman. In the early 70s, he opened up the Cardinal Bar. The Cardinal Bar hosted a different audience every night. Gay night, it was fetish night. Fetish night, salsa night, blues night for African Americans, and a non-drinking night once a month for indigenous. So Ricardo is an icon in the late 70s. He is in his late 70s. He's one of the basins that made me nauseous. It was all so... But again, he has letters from his nanny in Cuba, letters from Los Cinco, the five Cubans who were arrested for spying in the United States. He said at the Camagüey Madison Sister City uh, affiliation, and again, he was out gay in the 70s. I don't know about you, but in the Latinx community, back when I was growing up, no one talked about it. But in the 70s, he was out gay. And he, when he ran for office in somewhere up here where uh, Jolly Green Giant, I can't remember the name of the city what he was in. It's not Rhineland. Anyway, his motto was pot, abortion, and gay rights in the, in the early 70s. One photo we have of Ricardo, I don't use it in presentations because it's a little delicate. One photo is him standing in front of the American flag in a suit at a city council meeting. Another one is a flyer for the Cardinal Bar for fetish night. And there is a gentleman with leather pants, no shirt, bandoleros, holding Ricardo on the bar on all fours with a dog collar, like this, while he's alderman, the, one of the bravest men I've ever met in my life. Here's a picture of baby Ricardo and his mom in Cuba. Here is a letter he donated from his nephew in which he collect, saved his coins for Ricardo's run for alderman and sent him. That's the kind of archives we're getting at this point in time. Here we are working with Carla Martinez and Emily Alanis of Mecha. Mecha is a Chicano movement student organization created in the early 70s nationally. In the Mexican Revolution, art played a significant role. Diego Rivero, Orozco Seguin, and Mecha uses the same model. So their archives include organizational records and original movement art created by Chicano students over the past 35, 40 years at Madison campus. It's a gold mine. And we were doing an exhibit just on Mecha student artwork. Nelly Olivencia, un Kenya from the Bronx, worked a lot with the Panthers out east. And this was one of the archives she turned in. For those of you Aldrich don't know, Aldrich Cleaver was a very famous Black Panther who was incarcerated. And uh, that's one of her archives. She also donated advertising cards from the Fillmore East from the early 70s to the mid 80s for every, con uh, every performance. So, you know, what? Pink Floyd, Jimi Hendrix, Carlos Santana, all of that, like this, piles, incredible. So now we'll talk about the digital edition. What is it? Well, the easiest way to explain it is we will create websites specific to the themes I shared with you. So a website on migration and immigration. It'll have a scholarly narrative of giving background, and then oral history and archives will be embedded in that. And again, that will generate P12 curriculum, and all of that will be able to be used in college, of course. So that's the digital edition idea. 
and that's the 10-year work, and we're just getting started with that million-dollar drop that we just got. Ooh, I'm not moving. There we go. So what are we looking for in the future? We're looking for collaboration for more than the campuses we have now so that the stories, the triumphs are documented and become part of our narrative for Wisconsin. And we want to ensure the long-term preservation of what we've collected. That's a benefit of working with the Wisconsin Historical Society. We are blessed with that organization. I don't know of another state where a state historical society has decided to actively partner to do something like this. There are various campuses that have done things similar, but never involving their state system. So we're very lucky. Here we have Elmita Miranda, who's been implementing all of our grants. And at the, our symposium last year, and at the symposium, the people that participated came up to us afterwards and said, thank you. At last, this work is getting done. Others said, not only thank you for doing this, but thank you for putting it back into the P-12 system so that our children know our history. And then, where's my city, was the other question. And that's why we need you. Here we have the first gathering of the core team that I shared with you earlier. We, at the symposium last October, it was the first time we actually met face to face. We did all our work through Zoom, including the oral histories, because of the pandemic. So it was remote viewing and remote work. So, you might be wondering why I quoted Carolina more than once in this presentation. Carolina graduated from East High School in Green Bay. She, is a, she was a history major at UW-Madison. She went on to graduate school, earned her PhD in history. She's now tenure track at Indiana Bloomington. And she has volunteered to be a resource to UW-Green Bay should you choose to move forward, because she's also doing history work in Green Bay. And there's real, there's real possibility for blending. So she went on to be, become faculty, which is my dream. I want you in grad school, or I'll haunt you after my death. And I want you to become faculty, because first generation can relate to first generation students. I've seen it over and over where middle-class bourgeois Chicanos can no longer understand the struggles of being poor. And that will be a huge schism, given we are concentrated in the lower economic ranks of the state. So, much can happen at Green Bay, should you choose to be involved. Carolina is a shining example of what can happen to our students. And she's not the only one. Nicole Gonsell, who is now Sister Nicole, has her PhD. I mean, it, we can go on and on on where we've seen success for our students. I'll close now with, these are the various sites that you can find out more information about us. And you have my cell number. I give it out to anyone. I've never got a crank call, a wild text, naughty stuff, nothing. No, people get, it, get the work and contact me when they need to. So I'm going to stop now so that we can have some Q&A. Okay? Thank you very much. And thanks to your wonderful tech team. You have the best tech, not tech team I've ever seen. A lot of information, but can we give Tess another round of applause for the work that she's been doing? So when you think about 
all that she has shared, some of the stories that she talked about, when you think about that evolution from diversity to solidarity, I thought that was pretty powerful. Can you talk a little bit more about how that came to be, how you put together those two words when you think about this work? I stole it. <laughs> but I always ask permission. I say, I love that idea. Can I steal it from you? Yesenia Savera, faculty at UW-Whitewater, who is part of the core team, actually came up as a graduate student, and now she's faculty at Whitewater. Uh, she came up with that in a course, and she told her students, you know, we talk about Latino unity, and she talked about Latinidad means nothing unless there's solidarity. And I really like that because the demographics of Wisconsin used to be predominantly Chicano, Mexican, American. The new immigrants in the past 10 years have been Latin American and South America. And I'm telling Chicanos, we have to learn how to play together. The way we got Nes Flores as the first Latino Chicano regent was through solidarity. I worked with first wave Cubans who fled because their plantations were, were taken by Castro. I do not agree with those kind of ideologies. They use the term Hispanic. I don't use that word, but I use it in the title of the organization because I had Cubanos and Puerto Ricanos who use that marker. So I stole it from Yesenia and I moved it from, divert, from Latinidad to solidarity, from, to diversity and solidarity. And I think it's really important. You know, the organizational change models that I use when I work with uh, Fortune 500, you know, Boeing was a client for many years on diversity and help them understand that bringing us in is one aspect of work. But the institution, what it offers, how it offers, how it connects to the community, all of that matters. It's not just colorizing an institution. It's colorizing, it's incorporating us in the curriculum, it's incorporating our communities, respecting, honoring, and embracing. So that's how we morphed. I stole it and then I morphed it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Questions? See, they're always silent. Oh, up top. There we are. Thank you so much for coming to Green Bay. I'm David Velker, a professor of history here. Mm. And I have a question about how you conduct the interviews. Are, are some of them conducted in Spanish? Or do you also conduct some in English? Yes. Um, yeah. And the majority of the interviews are conducted in English. In the case of a Spanish speaking person, we you may not have a person in a class that speaks Spanish, so we can help you with that. Once this, if the student does speak Spanish and conducts it in Spanish, we pay for the translation. And then I would mention that the reason we're staying with the Zoom-based oral histories is they, they produce a transcript. It's dirty, but we clean it up, and then that also goes online. That makes our records searchable by doing that. Thank you. And a follow-up question, does the collective provide uh, training resources to help instructors and, yes. and groups and so forth who might want to yes. conduct the interviews? Yes. Can you tell yes. us just a little bit yes. about what that we, looks like? We, I authored a toolkit and there are vid embedded links to vi training videos. There are training materials for oral history, history methodology, instructions on how to use the various sound waivers and the like for the historical society. Uh, and what 
My role is, amongst many others, is working with instructors as they develop their courses for the first time. Sometimes I help them beyond their first course. So I work with the instructor on the syllabus if they want me to suggest readings and make sure that certain aspects of our toolkit training are included in the course, uh, especially on the sensitive population issue of undocumented. So there's training and support for instructors through me it, as you develop a course and throughout the course. In some cases, I help identify the cohort for interviews. Excellent, thank you so much. You're welcome. So as I think about some of the things that you shared, what, what I liked about the innovation is it can be open for the community and for students to actually think about who they want to interview. Yeah. So I appreciate that it's not prescribed because when you think about the 72 counties in the state, they're all a little different. When you think about some of the people that you grew up with that you may think is special that others may not know about, they could be a part of this. Right. And so I really appreciate that openness. Question. Hi, my name is Sue Smith. I'm an associate professor of ethnic studies at Lawrence University. I'm here with two Lawrence University colleagues as well. Uh, so this sounds so incredible. I have a couple questions about it. One, is there um, any um, grant funds or something that comes out of the org if you're looking to, as like faculty, kind of connect with you all and continue this project? Um, would be my first question. And then second, is there any thematic ideas that you have in terms of, um, like I was just thinking of that last little bit on the gay uh, Latino man and thinking about how you could have uh, thematic archives in essence, ones that follow LGBT uh, Latina folks or ones that follow um, women and ones that follow men and just different kind of thematic points to the archive. So if there any thought about that. Okay. First of all, I heard the first question. The second one was really garbled at this end, so I'm not gonna ask you to repeat okay. that. The first question was about my funds yeah. to help you. Yeah. Okay, in a nutshell, no. Uh, the campuses, I think it's Parkside has a Office of Community Engagement and they give out small grants of maybe 250 to $500 to help an instructor um, with oversight of the, the research. And we, so what we're trying to do is, is get institutions to see if they can help. But I know how tight things are. I mean, I understand that. Uh, but at this point, we don't. But when things come up that are a stumbling block to important work, we try to find ways to make things happen. But it's not often. Okay, and then your second question was? Yeah, it's about kind of the archive, is if it's organized around particular themes. So thinking about the LGBT folks, thinking about women, thinking about gender, thinking about uh, disability, for instance, uh, if any themes come out or any ways that you all are thinking about continuing this work that might be thematic. The archive collections are generated usually through oral history interviews we find out that someone is ready to donate or would consider donating. And so there are not themes, it's availability and accessibility. We looked at national, we're part of a 10, 10 grantees that are doing work on ethnic communities nationally. Uh, Beautiful projects, my God, two in, in California on Asians and internment loss of properties. Uh, African American in Georgia on underground railroad sites. I mean, incredible work. What we found out is we're the baby on the block because they all have archives and oral histories. Their grant is going to be used to put them online. We're starting from square one. We're getting the oral history, the archives, and we're going online. So we're very ambitious, but we take 
the opportunistic approach to archives. If you have them, we'll take them, because we're really starting from very little. The Historical Society has some collections that are mostly on migrant workers, and it stops at around the 80s. It was a real hot protest movement up until the early 80s in Wisconsin for migrant workers, and that died down. So they were very hungry for us to partner with us. But no themes, we just take them, because we have nothing. Thank you for asking that question. That allows me to put a little plug in for the Our Voices archive project that our yeah. library here on campus has. And if you go to the Neville Museum, it is up for several months and it is amazing with stories as well as uh, archival pieces to the collection. So just stellar. Other questions? Hi, um, my name is uh, Juan Garcia Ollervides, and I'm a professor of, in uh, the University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh. Uh, we just started a new program in Chicano Latino Studies, uh, or rather, we're about to start it because I just got hired. Um, <laughs> and all of these things that you were talking about um, are amazing, and I would I don't want to speak for my institution. I'm going to speak for my students. Um, I think a lot of us would be interested in getting involved uh, with this work. Um, and really, yeah, that, this is not a question. I mean, my question would be, if we invite you, would you come? I guess yes. that would be my question. <laughs> yes. Yes, I will come. Uh, I, I did get a recent email that the new director of Chicano Latino Studies, is that you? Yes, that's me. Uh, was interested. Yes, I got that email two days ago, and you're on my list to follow up. Okay. <laughs> but I was getting ready for this one. Uh, and then I asked Dawn, I said, gee, Oshkosh is interested. Are you going to compete? Because <laughs> there's plenty to go around. We can well, can I just say one thing? Um, yeah. I, I appreciate what you mentioned, and you know, I understand that institutions are competing for the same students. I have no issue, and I have really no intention of competing with anybody. Um, Solidarity is what drives me, and that's what I'm here to do. So that's it. Uh, well, thank you very it, much for your presentation. It was, it, was, it was very good. Well, Oshkosh has its own history with, in particular, Chicano community out of Racine, Kenosha area. A lot of the men of my, I'm 72, a lot of the men of my age were U, UW Oshkosh grads. And honestly, it was because it was a great party school. That's what they did. <laughs> so you know, I'd say, and where did you? Oshkosh, and Oshkosh. Then it was usually over a beer that they were telling me this evening. I said, and why? Great parties. But you also have a great, you also have a great curriculum array. And I, you know, all the cluster campuses, I'm sorry, from system, we talk about comprehensive and cluster campuses and Wickwick campuses and all that. So I speak in code sometimes. But you know, I really feel like in the past 20 years, the comprehensive, the non-doctoral institutions have really evolved in their, in their majors and minors and keeping abreast of the market needs. I, and I know it's not fun to talk about students as a market, but it is. And, and I think these, the comprehensive have done a really good job of creating niches for their, their academic offerings. And, I think you're in great shape. So yes, we will talk and I will come. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'll just add, I really appreciate that Lawrence is here and Oshkosh is here because yes. really this is a growing region. And if you think about programs like this, it's about collecting the information so that we can share it in K-12 right. so that everybody in this area really understands who's here what's happening and what's going on and what they can look to in the future with uh, Carolina Ortega's information. I mean, Green Bay, Madison, Indiana, how can I help? So that's, that's what this story is about. So I'm just you know, pleased that you said yes and that you all said yes and came and you emailed two days ago and here you are. Because it really is about this community meeting then the needs of the region in terms of what those uh, economies are. And so I, I see that Juan is here from 
uh, the Latino Professional Association. Mm. And it's important that businesses are here, that everybody is here hearing the story so we can think about solidarity and what we can do in the region. Yeah, good point. Thank Next you. question. Hi, thank you so much for your, for your presentation. This is great. Um, it, right now, in the political climate we're in, it, we're very much in turmoil with immigrants and different, you know, people of color. How is your organization helping to teach more uh, positivity, more inclusion in regards to your communities and especially working with such young kids and trying to preserve the important important work that you're doing with your culture? We don't do a lot of educating others on what we're doing right now. Because we're so crazy busy, we've grown so fast in three and a half years that we, we don't have the time for that. However, the beauty of our project is that the Historical Society has agreed to put all the oral histories online. And then again, the DEs with the archives and clips embedded. This, it was absolutely critical to our work that it's all publicly accessible so that whatever institution you are in by searching immigrant, migrant, you can pull up all the interviews and transcripts with highlights on quotes that you can use. So the hope is that what we produce goes online, educates others. Uh, but it's, it's difficult at this point in time for us to go out and, and tell folks about the products we are trying to produce, because we're still producing. I'm, it's not really much of an answer, but. There it is. Thank you for being here today. My name is Kay. I'm the director of our career planning office here on campus. And I had saw a little note on one of your slides about internships. Um, and it got me thinking a little bit. Do you have a vision at all of how interns or um, some of this work could turn into internship opportunities for students? I can't hear what she's saying. <laughs> I really can't. No, it's, I can try it's to. Gumbled. It's gumbled. Yes, you bet. I'm the director of our career. Internship. Yeah. You, did we have interns? I saw a note on one of your slides about internships. Just yes. noted on the bottom. And I didn't know if you had a vision or some intentionality behind what you're thinking. When we've had interns, what we've done is, for example, the history department at Madison subsidized student hires for two semesters. And those students were paid interns on the work. So it came from the history department, which John tells me is historically very well off, almost as well off as UW-Madison School of Business. I don't know how that works, <laughs> but history's got money. And so they've been subsidizing, on occasion, students as interns. We've also done independent studies. I do independent studies. I stopped teaching. Uh, and I do independent study supervision and work with a grad student or undergrad on some aspect of the collective work, but it's not paid. Sure. Okay. They get to work with me and watch me sweat and fret. So, so one thing that we're thinking about when we think about our campus and our student needs, we're really looking at what would be the right way that meets our student needs and how our campus operates. And so what I've learned is that we have sometimes interns that can work projects for a semester. This could be one of them. When I think about our um, staff who work with students, for example, some are the um, directors working with our student organizations. So if they were to work with the student orgs, how might we create an internship-like experience? Mm -hmm. So we're really wanting to be open and creative. And so that's why as I think about the roundtables, which is sort of that next step 
from today's conversation, we want to hear the ideas from our students. How might you want to participate in class, out of class, as a student org? When, I, when we talk to the faculty and staff, yep, it could be a part of the course, but it also could be faculty or staff actually having a group of students work with them independent or on the side or their own voice. So we really want to be open to hearing the ideas that campus has. And then when we have the community roundtables, what communities may wish to be involved in how. It may not just be doing the oral history. Maybe they want to be a part of collecting histories because maybe they're thinking about going back to grad school and that might be part of the preparation that they do on their own. So we really want to be open and really hear those ideas and think about what the best way would be to bring it to campus. On, on a related note, uh, I'm working with an intern, I forgot until just now, I'm working with the intern on Mondays and Tuesdays at the Historical Society. She's a library science student and the Betty Blank Center for Public History is funding that library student to work with us processing the Mecha artwork and other organizational archives. So that's how we get our, our interns. It's usually externally funded or they're doing it because they want the experience. Great question. Other questions? Hello, I'm Paula Ganyard. I'm the director of the library here, oh. um, which also includes our archives. And thank you to Dr. Krim for the plug for our voices, which is our oral history collection. Um, but I have a question regarding the physical archives that you collect along the way. And being part of the historical society, one of the things about Wisconsin that's different than any other state too is that we have the area research network that moves co physical collections. So when a researcher here at Green Bay wants to research something, if it's physically in La Crosse, it gets moved here, or if it's in Madison and so on. So I, I guess a couple of things um, is, first, as the interviewers are going out to do the work and they learn about these physical materials, is that going back to have someone from historical society or are we relying on the area research network individuals? I do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like I said, I do all, all kinds of things. Uh, once an archival collection is identified, I do the field investigation, look at the collection, see what niches it fills just for my own rec mind. I watch who's being documented in what parts of the state by the institutions so that we're not tripping on each other, duplicating efforts. Uh, we are all stretched. So I work that way on the archives. I go out in the field, yes, we want this. Well, we never say no, we want this. And then it's a matter of finding someone, usually a student and myself, working at the home of the donor to organize. Then we get up to the Historical Society and that's another uploading process on their side. I don't understand the exact relationship you have with the Historical Society, but it sounds like you're also a site for them. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. All right, there's, there's, uh, we have another campus like that. I can't remember which one. And we're working on ways to share the archives. Parkside, yes, Parkside has an archivist, and they're also a historical society site. So, for example, the students produce podcasts out of their oral history interview because it's a podcast course. And then the archivists at Parkside are loading them on their website, and we link to it. So, we're trying to ensure that if there are hometown histories, archives that would be better would better serve the community staying where it is, we can do that too. 
everything's negotiable because we're, we don't know what we're doing. We're just growing, right? And so we're very flexible. So just for your knowledge, every UW except for UW Superior has an area research center as part of their archives. Wow. Which is a connection with the historical society. Thank you for that. I have to learn more about it. So this, my next question, and, the, and promise last, um, is probably further in the future then. Um, one of the things that I think has been really valuable about the connection with the Neville and our oral history collection for our voices is that there is this exhibit that brings that history to life in a different manner. So are you thinking down the road of being able to have some sort of um, exhibits where people yes, can go in? Yes, absolutely, consume? yes. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the suffragette history that the Historical Society has right now. There are traveling exhibits, and there are select pieces that go with that exhibit. That's the model we will be following for the collective. Again, if you're going to use it in a, a P12 classroom, we want you to be able to access as much as possible. Other questions? Great. So what I want to share as we wrap up is this uh, presentation has two parts. Today, you got a chance to hear a bit of the background of the program, a bit of the history, how it came to be, and then the components of the collective. For Green Bay to consider being a part of it, we have a round table set up. Today, we will have a round table with our students who are present, who may come in at 3.30. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we have a virtual round table for community members. We realize sometimes coming to campus could be a bit of a challenge, so we didn't want people to have to come back two days in a row. So we thought, let's go ahead and put that online, be virtual. So that will be from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. And then from 10.30 to 11.30, we will have a faculty and staff roundtable that is a hybrid approach in the 1965 room in the University Union. So if you're present, please come in. If you are at a distance, please tune in. And the roundtables will be set up for you to ask more specific questions hear an overview about the program, a brief one, and uh, Tessa Reynas will talk about how to be involved and how Green Bay can be involved, uh, providing some examples of how some of the other institutions are involved. And so today, immediately following the session, we have a reception uh, set up for an, until 3.30. Uh, and then the students will come back here into Fort Hall where we re will rearrange the seating so that we can talk about participation and ideas that you have about the program and just hearing insights of what you've heard here today. So if you could please join me in a round of applause for Tessa Reynas and the collective. Thank you, thank you. And I just want to say, is there food at the reception? Oshkosh, did you hear that? <laughs> They're feeding us. Just keep that in mind. I'm not saying it's a condition, but it helps. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And I hope to see you at the reception and the round tables where we can talk more in depth. In particular, the way different disciplines have structured courses. Um, very interesting models. For each of the campuses, courses are different, different topics, different disciplines, different approaches, all producing the work that we need. So please join us throughout the rest of the two days. Thank you so much.